Hi, everybody, and welcome to Decoding Culture. So this is a show where we invite a panel of guests to try and make sense of a cultural topic in real time. In this episode, we try to decode the dynamic between the sexes, so possibly the oldest and hardest cultural topic out there. Really, we were curious to see how deep this dynamic goes. Can the tensions of the culture wars be seen as a symptom of a clash between the feminine and the masculine? To try and make sense of it, I was joined by three guests. First up is Rachel Haywire, who's the author of The New Art Right and the founder of Elixir Salon. And here's Rachel talking about the role of masculinity in the cultural conversation. And I think the source of power of the masculine can be channeled by people all over the gender spectrum. I unfortunately am viewing a demasculization, a demasculinity of, of many men. Um, and this isn't a homosexuality thing. This is a, you know, just masculine culture in itself has um, feminized and it has softened. And I think that men should be men. We were also joined by Ian McKenzie, and Ian's a filmmaker, a writer, and he's the host of the Mythic Masculine podcast. Ian made some great points on the difference between balance and opposition between the sexes. You know, I think the culture at large, because it's so wounded in its relationship between the genders, it is much more likely to see that gender itself is oppositional to each other, right? The masculine is oppositional to the feminine. And that's such a deeply, that's like a traumatized understanding, I think, of these energies. And we were also joined by Raven Connolly, who is a cultural commentator and a regular host at the STOA, including a series that she and Rachel host together called The Philosopher Queens, where they explore feminine archetypes in contemporary culture. And here's Raven talking about the link between online discourse and feminine rivalry. And I think that's also something that we see in online discourse, in the way that groups scapegoat one another, in the way in which they elevate their own purity and moral superiority, and think of themselves as doing justice by by telling everybody or exposing, you know, details of somebody's life that are against the moral order of the moment and attempting to ostracize them and moving the community against them, that is all related to this idea of, of, the, of the feminine rival. So it, part of this format, the show, is that we start things off and keep the conversation going with images and clips. This is a really iconic image uh, that was on the cover of, of Life magazine, which is a, a sailor uh, kissing a woman on uh, VE Day, uh, so um, when when the Allies won World War II, and on the right is a statue of that moment um, during, which was kind of graffitied with a hashtag Me Too during the Me Too movement. And the reason I've chosen this is a, there's a few reasons. I mean, there's a backstory to um, this picture, which is that this this woman didn't really want to be kissed. Um, this guy was just going going down the street, uh, kissing everyone, and, and you know she later said that it wasn't really consensual. So I wanted to just open up and and see um, what comes up for for you when you see this image. I think that when you go to war, you're going to face a lot of trauma. There's no way of getting around that, and I think it's interesting because you're seeing two references to PTSD in a way. You're seeing the woman who is referencing the PTSD that comes with sexual assault. And you're seeing the man perhaps referencing the PTSD coming home from war. And you're seeing them unified in an uncomfortable juxtaposition of trauma in a way. I find that fascinating because of the trauma that one experiences in war and the way that that mixes with the trauma one experiences sexual assault in this almost this artificial, you know, this cover on Time magazine, which is an artificial construct. It's a a narrative. It's a, a photo shoot. So there's definitely something a little bit dark there to unpack um, that is definitely on the shadow end of things. Um, there's a part of me that wonders what would happen if the roles were reversed, if the woman was coming back from war and embracing the man 
and the man felt uncomfortable with being kissed that way. And he wrote a story about it on the internet. What would happen then? There are so many different variables here of gender and trauma and responses to each of these things. And it's definitely uncomfortable and provocative simultaneously. I love how much that reversal just made me laugh because there's there's something so absurd about that idea, which really speaks to sexual difference, sexual dimorphism, and the kind of dichotomy of the masculine and feminine in and of itself. But the idea of women coming back from war and just grabbing a man off the street <laughs> is kind of funny. Um, it, it, and I, I think that reveals something because in, in, something else about this is that women's sexuality during that time was still much more guarded, you know, for, so this, for this woman, there could have been a sense that if she was being kissed in public and photographed, that that would be an issue for her honor, you know, and, and her chastity and for her perception, because there was a lot of social stigma for women at this time. For, at, I mean, there's still social stigma today, a hangover from the patriarchal structures uh, that controlled the sexuality of women as a kind of contract. There was a kind of contract struck up between men and women um, to change the dynamics of society with monogamy. And uh, that has kind of ingrained the sense of purity of the, of the virgin. It's interesting that in the image, and of course we don't know anything about this woman's you know, understanding of her own sexuality. But at least the way she looks in the image, she's wearing all white, which of course like represents the virgin or purity. And uh, she also seems resistant to this act of, of sexual aggression. And of course there's there's one archetype of a woman that you could imagine not, be interest, not being interested in that. But you can also imagine another woman who would love to kiss the men when they came back from war, who would be kissing all of the men, you know? Um, and and that that would actually be an experience of of exaltation of joy and um, maybe this is more of the channeling of of the full kind of lover archetype where there's this openness and willingness and interest to receive and to give even to even to strangers and I think that that is actually a part of our culture that's emerging uh, in full force female affection female sexuality that is unrepressed and that is not guarded against the stranger. In fact, is seeking the stranger, seeking the observation of the stranger, the interaction with the stranger. And that is a kind of uh, alternative aspect to this notion of female sexuality, that it's not always that the woman is, um, you know, modest and, and trying to maintain her, her her bubble or her sovereignty, there's there's a sense also of the woman embracing um, the the man and even the strange man. You know, for me, I'm appreciating. I mean, the 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 unpacking that Rachel and Raven are doing. Thank you. I mean, when I look at that image, <clears throat> I mean, I see again that that snapshot of a moment or what a what a culture, what a people are trying to see about themselves or want to see about themselves. And so, you know, if I look at that, it, it really is an icon to me of a sort of a desire for a simplistic uh, age when it was very clear, you know, what were the sort of most pure representations of the gender function or the gender roles. And so in that image, if you see the man, you know, f like fully taking the woman, right, like in that sense. And then the idea, you know, of course, the story was a little bit different. It says, but the image captures a sense that the woman is therefore being being fully taken. And so in some sense, she's ultimately, you know, the fullness of what passivity is, not as a negativity, but more as like receiving the man. And then the man or the masculine principle is like fully penetrating, you know, or fully taking her. And, you know, again, that's a very powerful image as a way of sort of celebrating a moment of, you know, the war being over as a sort of almost like a return home to a kind of whole whole a unity of some kind, but a, but a kind of simplistic unity. You know, now, I think it's always interesting, though, too, to recognize, like, not as a kind of uh, explaining away 
you know, well, that's just the way it was then, you know, not like that's happening here, but I, I'm not on that side. But I'm also very wary of this kind of revisionist, and uh, you know, look at other times to say, oh yeah, like that's exactly what was going on. Again, I feel like it can go way too far, this kind of revisionist look. Um, but for me, it is interesting to see, again, like what are the images trying to say at the moment or unconsciously, what are they trying to project um, as a, yeah, as almost like the psychological state of the nation in that moment. And so for me, again, like that's really compelling alongside, again, the shadow, which I think me too is very much about that. The shadow kind of coming home and saying, uh, you know, what about this? One thing that I think is, is, a frame worth mentioning that I, uh, I'm really curious to hear you guys' thoughts on is um, is the the narrative that of what patriarchy is that gets kind of um, brought back into the past and then gets adapted to to use as a frame for how we understand our lives now. Um, you know, for example, uh, uh, Warren Farrell, who we've uh, had on Rebel Wisdom, who wrote, um, who was a really leading voice in in a uh, major feminist organization in the states in the '70s. Um, uh, and started doing men's groups and realizing, oh, wow, actually this, this thing we're calling patriarchy is having as much of an effect on men as well. And, you know, you know, wrote a book where he talked about the, um, the fact that men have been, young men in particular, have been expendable throughout history and kind of been, you know, sent off to war to die. Um, in, you know, whether you agree with it or not, in their minds to protect the, uh, the more vulnerable, the, the women and the children. And so that's going on at the same time as a, as a really legitimate concern about the, the consent. So that is something that I think is really important that we surface. And that there is a kind of, it's so complex, because there is a necessary shadow to come out of that and a necessary conversation to come out. And yet there's all these other important questions and narratives, like that guy's experience through the war, what he was doing it for, the, you know, the role that was pushed onto men and that was pushed onto women, and, and how we make sense of that. You know, Alex, you brought up patriarchy and... You know, I'd love to unpack that for a second because, you know, I've also gone through, you know, a sense of trying to understand, like, what do we mean when we say that, right? And in what context and in and, and what sort of archetypal um, arrangement, you know, are we speaking to? Because I find too often if it's used to like shorthand, too flippantly, right, then it, people can have their own interpretations of what we mean by that. And, you know, I think in this context, we might say, uh, from what I'm gleaning, right, the the sort of domination of men or, or the rule of men, you know, as, as a patriarchal structure. And, you know, I've been really appreciative of, uh, or appreciated Bell Hooks, you know, and her take on patriarchy and um, the will to change. And I think she really succinctly talks about how the, the consequence of patriarchy with this understanding uh, on women, but also on men, you know, in a very compassionate way, has been really instructive. And then, you know, I went ahead and read uh, Chalice and the Blade with Rianne Eisler, uh, that you might be familiar with again. And she, you know, totally had her way with me in terms of, you know, what do we mean when we actually say patriarchy? Because uh, she, I think, really, you know, beautifully articulated what what is behind that is actually domination culture um, as, a, as a sort of, as a construct. And so I personally find that when we don't speak to the domination culture element, I find it gets too much, you know, patriarchy gets cast as the bad guy. And the problem is that we just have to, you know, rotate out uh, men and put in women into positions of power and, you know, suddenly things will be great. And, uh, you know, I think that's happened, you know, in the past where it hasn't been the case because they tend to be sitting at the levers of power in the same domination system that the men have. I've also been making a film for the last six years about a community in Portugal called Tamara, of which they've got, you know, they're kind of way out there in terms of edgy, you know, gender dynamics and things like that. And what they found, and again, not to universalize it, is just that when there's a certain degree of safety and trust uh, from the feminine, let's say that the deepest longing that emerges again and again to women that go there and, you know, really work through a lot of the, you know, elements that are there is that that's a deep longing is to be fully, absolutely taken, right? And um, I'm not saying necessarily by a man, but that there is something true in that dynamic, you know, when we can kind of clear away the trauma and the history and things like that. So again, it's just, I think it's helpful to unpack those things that, you know, often this is what's missed, I think, with the kind of um, reaction to, to trespass, which I think Me Too is, you know, it's very much a like no more stop, uh, you know, about the power dynamics. But often if it throws out these deeper kind of archetypal truths as well, then I think it, it misses the boat. I agree with a lot of what Ian is saying, especially patriarchy being a scapegoat, a boogeyman for everything that is wrong with society. It sometimes doesn't even have any meaning. It's just like down with patriarchy, like 
what are you even talking about, right? Be more specific. Um, and then there is the issue of the consent being blurred and changed in a lot of ways. And I think that that's confusing for a lot of women growing up. Um, and I also want to add that a lot of women in the working and lower middle classes feel left out of the Me Too movement because they're not celebrities that are getting coverage for their sexual traumas. And they find the Me Too movement alienating to them because it seems to be um, like kind of bourgeoisie. Um, and I think that's a whole different thing to unpack. Um, but it's, it's really fascinating as a whole to see all these varied responses to Me Too and to feminism and to patriarchy, just the sheer diversity of reactions to it is very stimulating and it's impossible not to feel the culture changing with these energies that keep moving in these different directions. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we can continue to get into some of these threads and the rest of the images and particularly um, the these the issue of, of, of let's say domination culture. I thought that was a really interesting way of kind of getting at the heart of maybe what is what we feel is the true issue with the boogeyman that's patriarchy. Um, and in my eyes, I, I think of patriarchy in this kind of really dry uh, anthropological sense where it's an, it's an arrangement, you know, it's a social arrangement that emerged out of a kind of particular type of uh, social rivalry. And uh, it, it solves certain kinds of problems. It created other kinds of problems. And uh, it's also kind of coexistent with the Abrahamic religions and the idea of the, 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 the revelatory religions, the idea of the law the, and the creation of the patriarchs and in the Old Testament with Abraham and um, all of the stories of, of these men building their, of their, their tribes. And uh, it's, I think it's, a, it's an important thing to become more in touch with the aspects of life that our ancestors were living with. So yeah, we want to really make sense of masculine, feminine, um, you know, sexuality, power, how it's influencing culture. I think it's quite important that we define what do we actually mean by masculine and feminine. And so the the image I wanted to use as a thought starter for that is um, this very uh, familiar image of, of yin and yang. The Taoist um, view of the masculine and feminine is, is you know, uh, is, is of that kind of um, mutual arising. Uh, and I think that's something that we, we often lose in, um, certainly in Western culture, where it's far more atomized and things don't imply one another, but things are either one thing or the other thing. So I find it a very a useful model. There are some who would argue that even the, the poles of masculine and feminine are social constructs, um, which I disagree with quite a bit. I think really, uh, if you don't have the polarity, you can't play with any, you can't play with gender if there aren't poles on either end, uh, the way I see it. Um, but I wanted to just explore this and actually see what, see what you think. You know, And I thought a fun way to do that would be for uh, Raven and Rachel to explore what do you understand by the masculine and uh, Ian and myself to explore what do we understand by the feminine? Um, the masculine. In my sense, on the most kind of like abstract level, ma the masculine principle is the, is the active principle, um, the one of action and um, movement and the penetration of will into reality and the movement of things, the transformation of things within a certain um, kind of burst of inspiration. Maybe the inspiration comes from the feminine, but you guys can maybe talk about that. Um, that the masculine is, is, a, is the one who goes off and out into, into the distance and is, is about traversing and movement and change and that's kind of the most abstract way in which I relate to the masculine principle. And of course, both women and men can embody this um, aspect within themselves. I think the, sh the shadow side of this principle can be, uh, it's 
domination, its desire to to act in a way that limits the choices and and the possibility of action of others, and to do so in, as part of its mission. I think you know we can understand as well, kind of with a more personified embodiment of the masculine as as the king, the masculine as the warrior, as the the magician. As the prince, these these figures over the course of a man's, uh, you know, kind of archetypal development or the archetypes that he can embody um, based on his disposition and, and um, characteristics over the course of his life. With that, I'm curious to hear what, what Rachel has to say. Well, I just wanted to say I love your mention of the divine king, the prince, as archetypes of the masculine. And I would also add that masculinity is strength. Masculinity is power. I think of the apollinium, the order, the structure, the constructing of civilizations, the will to build. Masculinity, like Raven says, is active. And I think the source of power of the masculine can be channeled by people all over the gender spectrum. I unfortunately am viewing a demasculization, a demasculinity of, of many men. Um, and this isn't a homosexuality thing. This is a, you know, just masculine culture in itself has um, feminized and it has softened. And I think that men should be men. And I don't really see the reason to sugarcoat the masculine and make it something that it isn't because the strength and masculinity is strength. It is power. It is the king. It is the prince. It is the lion. It is the, the divine monarch, the, the anarch, you know, the, the individual asserting oneself. And that masculinity does not necessarily have to be a property of a man. It is simply a mode of existence. It is a divine energy. The masculine energy is its own thing that transcends patriarchy, culture war, and centuries. It is masculinity. And Ian, what do you understand by uh, the term the feminine, the concept? Yeah, thanks for this. You know, before I launch into that too, you know, seeing that image based on, you know, really trying to understand like trying to, you know, what, what does one see when they look at that image sort of at face value, you know, what came to me and I'm curious to even float it to the group, um, maybe just to think about it. But, uh, you know, if you look at that image immediately, do you see them in opposition to each other? Right. Do you see them as, as at war with each other or do you see them as dancing? or making love, right? And that to me is really interesting actually, because I think how a culture would look at that image or how a culture would look at gender would be based on that, what, how they experience, you know, how the culture experiences those genders. Because I think just to sort of as a prelude that, you know, I think the culture at large, because it's so wounded in its relationship between the genders, it is much more likely to see that gender itself is oppositional to each other, right? The masculine is oppositional to the feminine. And that's such a deeply, that's like a traumatized understanding, I think, of these energies. Um, whereas, you know, a deeper, you know, sort of more holistic understanding uh, and a cultural understanding that holds gender in high regard, as, it's, as in there, it's not a problem to solve. I guess that's what I'm kind of saying. And I think so much of modernity, because it's so wounded around its gender dynamics, is constantly trying to solve gender you know, to say, oh, it doesn't exist, or it's just a construct, or this and that, right? And and um, I just appreciate the image, at least for its just base level, you know, kind of pure transmission of just, again, you know, one only knows itself in relation to the other, as in you can't have, you know, just a free floating masculinity, it has to be in relation to femininity, if you're using that map. And so if I was to turn now to feminine, you know, what do I understand feminine to be? I mean, it really, for me, though, I mean, the, the nature of it is a kind of, I mean, yes, there's a receptivity, I think, which is could be intuition. It could be, you know, a kind of uh, a surrender, like these qualities, I think, come out. But at the same time, you know, it's only in those places of deepest surrender that one can receive vision, for example. One can receive, you know, insight and orientation. And so there is something to me about the receptivity, uh, you know, the emptiness provides for a sense of fullness to come in. 
Um, that 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 to me seems to be a, a quality of the feminine, as well as also a, a kind of um, perf- I don't know, performative is maybe not quite the right word, but a kind of um, expression. You know, just to trot out some words like you know the dance of Shakti, things like that. Like there is this expressive nature, I think, of the feminine that is also, you know, in its you know purest beauty, um, wants to be seen, you know, wants to be witnessed. Actually, what's coming through my head right now, like trying to define. What I understand by the feminine is that it doesn't want to be defined is the first thing that comes up. There's a, <laughs> there's a kind of shifting, complex quality that especially like as a man, I'm both fascinated by, confused by, sometimes scared by, um, uh, you know, and yeah, to Ian's point, I, re- I resonate with that a lot. Like the, that image of and, and the yin-yang principle I think depending on what culture you're looking at it from or, or what gender uh, you're looking at it from, you know, like that active masculine principle of, of moving forward, of, of uh, you know, penetrating and moving forward feels like it might be pushing the, the feminine principle back. But actually, you know, I perceive it as the, fe- as the feminine principle goes back, it pulls the masculine principle with it. You know, it's, it's similar to what you were saying, Ian, and, and simultaneously, as the masculine pushes, the feminine falls back and, and they are happening at the same time. And so that quality of being difficult to define is also because my experience of the feminine has uh, many different faces, has many different aspects to it. And I, you know, there are many different aspects to the masculine. There are many different masculine archetypes as well, but I feel them at least my perception of them is more clearly defined. You know, someone wrote a book called, you know, King, Warrior, Magician, Lever. It's like, here, bam, here's four archetypes. And they work, they work. You know, we use them in our in our uh, men's weekends to, to a degree as well. And I find those archetypes incredibly useful. Um, but the if, if I think of my experience with the feminine, you know, I think of, um, you know, incredible kind of power and force and potency at times. I think of compassion and receptivity and containing as well and nurturing. Um, I had an LSD trip one time where spontaneously I became an old grandmother in the trip. I had my eyes closed and I was a very old grandmother and it was I was just completely embodying that archetype. And I was watching three seedlings grow and I had to make sure that the seeds would grow past the, the level of the soil and kind of come into the air. And they had to be strong enough when they reached the top of the soil that they would survive. And so I was simultaneously in this mode of nurturing, but also some serious tough love and no bullshit, you know? And so that, that I associate that with the feminine as well. And so, yeah, that's a, you know, it's complex probably would be my experience overall. And there is a simplicity, I think, to the masculine. What I really want to ask everyone is which of those principles do you think is dominant in culture right now? Is it the masculine or the feminine principle having more of an impact on our cultural values in this moment? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, I, I also just wanted to say I, I love the idea of, of the feminine as defying definition. I think that that's perfect, actually, um, in, in its characterization. Uh, this kind of mercurial withdrawn nature of the feminine and the secrecy of the feminine, right? Which Which really makes it so mysterious and gives women this kind of aura and and power that there's the the appearance, but then there's also this withdrawn aspect that her treasure is, is, is hidden inside. And, you know, only the, only the, those who are initiated really get access to the, to the being that the is of, of, of the feminine of the woman. Um, So I, that's really what came to mind when you said that to me. I think that this aspect of secrecy and of rivalry that happens in these kind of indirect manner um, and the interest in in social dynamics and status is very much an aspect of what shows up in, in the feminine. And so my understanding of, let's say, digital culture uh, is is very much a world of, of the feminine principle, I think, more so than the masculine. And I think Rachel could probably riff on this in terms of the feminization, let's say, of men. Um, but there's actually a lot of work on um, and xenofeminism and 
kind of the transhumanist world that of of the femininity of the internet as a principle the fact of its decentralized nature its withdrawn kind of mercurial form the fact that there are these images and representations that are there to seduce you and to draw you in um and to your own little world and that those things are both beautiful but also can be dangerous and there is this way that we're watching each other so there's a voyeurism and of course there's also this voyeuristic element in the way that the woman presents herself um the way that the feminine is to be received and so there's this dichotomy between exposure which is also an aspect of the feminine to expose herself and to have herself be be, be witnessed as an aspect of how we engage online we expose the what is withdrawn or what is secret in order to be witnessed and that's definitely an aspect of our of our online behavior that's definitely true society's more in the direction of feminine and masculine now um, you can see it in the subtleties of advertising you can see it in the mysterious and the hidden and the invocation of private energies that are meant to be revealed at a later date but at the same time the revealing is masculine the surveillance is masculine so these energies are polarizing they're at war with each other but like ian said they're also in sync with each other when i looked at the image before i saw conflict and i saw connection i saw the ebb and the flow of a fight that was also a unity and i think both of these are going on at the same time all of the time. Male and female are in constant war, but they are also in constant synthesis, moving each other upward and an ever dynamic flow of continuation. And when we see the surveillance, which is very masculine, like I wanna look in, you know, and then the I wanna protect my privacy, which is very feminine, what we're seeing is people reacting to the the tech companies and their movements. So in a way, our gendered reactions online are based on the actions of the tech companies and their connections to the state. Um, and what I would like to see is gendered reactions in a more decentralized form so we could return to a more divine femininity with masculine characteristics of building. I think it's time to, so to speak, to, to turn the yin yang again and bring forth a new cycle. I mean, if we talk about the, the masculine principle of, of the doing, um, I would say that modernity by its very nature is out of contact. And by that meaning it's out of contact with life, I would make the case. Um, a good example maybe to bring it more personally is like if I'm in contact with a lover and maybe I'll speak about with a woman, you know, there's a certain ability to be able to receive cues, right? To be, to receive subtle and overt, you know, cues of, yes, this feels good. You know, maybe this doesn't actually, let's try this. Um, let's follow this. So, right. There's a very, it's a dynamic um, interchange of, of energies, um, dominance, submission, submission, you know, all of that, but you cannot be a good lover. I would make the case if you're not able to be in contact. Uh, because I use contact not as a sort of force meeting force, but actually a kind of relational achievement. And so I would say that the modernity at large, based on a masculine principle of constantly doing, is out of contact utterly with life. And the consequence of being out of contact is that we see the biosphere collapse and blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. Because life is constantly trying to give cues. Hey, you know, don't dig over here. Or like, hey, too much carbon in the atmosphere. Or, you know, whatever it is. And the inability to really take those cues in, I think defines, you know, maybe archetypally, the, the essentially the, it's almost like the boy hero of, of patriarchal, and I use that in quotations, the boy hero got lost in achievement constantly and, and doesn't know why he's achieving anymore, right? It's like this kind of undercurrent in the background and sort of an existential dread that if I stop doing, I'm gonna have to face the void, you know, that's on the side of the, of the non-doing. And that's too terrifying. So I'm just going to keep doing. I'm just going to keep digging up. I'm going to keep building higher. Um, and that's honestly how I would characterize this moment is that we're essentially ascending to the place of most 
transcendence, but at the consequence of everything else. Yeah. I'd love to uh, circle back to something that's come up so far, which is the idea of domination. Because I think power, like we can't, I feel like without talking about power and power dynamics, we can't, you know, we're, we're not talking about the, the, this fully, right? And so, you know, for me, you know, masculine domination as, as has been explored through the concept of patriarchy, for example, is very overt. It's very clear. It's like, it's, it's you, know, very, you know, potentially very physical, it's very kind of in your face. But I think the way we see it in culture, for me, seems like it's pretty clear. It's dictators. It's, um, it's you know, men shutting down women or it's men abusing women. I'm curious about what feminine domination looks like, because, you know, we were exploring that if we look at things through the terms of dominator cultures rather than everything's the patriarchy's fault, then we start looking at, okay, well, how does, how do both of those polarities dominate, you know? So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. What does, what does the, the feminine version of dominance look like? And are we seeing it in culture right now? And if so, where? One could argue that cancel culture is feminine because it involves a lot of gossip and backstabbing and cattiness. And there is unfortunately that negative aspect of femininity in which it becomes a very behind the scenes, she said, he said, who did what now, which is definitely not the way that femininity should be going. Um, but sometimes it does politically. Um, and one could argue for that reason that cancel culture is feminine. Um, but at the same time, if you explore the world of dominance, the sexual possibilities are endless. Um, everybody into BDSM knows this. Um, so you mentioned dictator before. I have been to some incredible clubs where women were dressed up as dictators of their own design. And that was their way of expressing dominance. And I just found that so beautiful. Uh, a lot of conservatives will say that that kind of thing is degenerate, but I think that they don't understand this type of art and self-expression and the way that we can play with dominance and gender and power. And I think it's fascinating that we're able to do these kinds of things that any regular person with a boring office job can just go into one of these clubs and dress themselves up as the, the queen of Persia or, or the, the great dictator. And they can have long, beautiful hair while they do it. They can carry a whip, um, they, they can carry chains and they can express their own form of dominance. So we're talking about dominance as an aesthetic dominance as a fetish that you can channel to express new forms of power. And then the negative form of feminine dominance, which relates to cancel culture and gossip. So I think it really depends on the type of dominance that we're talking about here. Yeah. I mean, I think that that really weaves in with my um, take on the feminine principle showing up on in the medium of online communication and, and uh, social media. And Rachel really put it into, into, good words in terms of talking about the nature of female rivalry and how it operates in a much more indirect and withdrawn manner. You can think about the evolutionary reasons why this might be the case. Women not wanting to get into um, violent conflicts with one another uh, because their bodies are their power. You, you don't want to risk mutilation or the incapacity of being able to carry a child or being able to breastfeed um, by enacting your rage against a woman for being your sexual rival, for um, potentially trying to steal resources from you through some sort of overt acts, acts of violence. While women are sometimes pushed to that position um, to defend actually their honor, uh, most of the time they're going to reach for tools of social manipulation in order to express their dominance in a group. And that usually takes the form of something that we call gossip. And the thing about gossip is that gossip has this dualistic nature to it. It appears as if you are giving valuable information to other people in your group. And it usually has some kind of like moral flavor to it. So I'm going to tell my friends that Rachel did such and such thing that I heard about because they should know, because it's important information. And I seem like I'm doing 
a great service to the community. I may even think that I'm doing Rachel a favor because I'm telling people something very important about what she's doing. And that type of plausible deniability, even though I may be motivated because she is my rival and I want to get her out of the picture and I want the community to turn against her and to ostracize her and to give me that power and dominance over the group rather than give it to her, that may be my shadow. But because I have this language where it sounds like good, inf good quality information and I'm trying to help the community, it makes me look like I'm doing something good. And so there's also this kind of duplicitous nature, self-deceptive quality to uh, the, the feminine aggression, the feminine rivalry. And I think that's also something that we see in online discourse, in the way that groups scapegoat one another, in the way in which they elevate their own purity and moral superiority and think of themselves as doing justice by, by telling everybody or exposing you know, details of somebody's life that are against the moral order of the moment and attempting to ostracize them and moving the community against them, that is all related to this idea of, of, the, of the feminine rival. And I think that there's a way in which this, this kind of aggression is very alien to male aggression, which is very upfront and exposed and direct. And so I think that there's this, ten this tension between these two types of aggression. And that women actually can learn a lot from, from learning the more masculine form of, of, of aggression and just being direct. And instead of behaving in this way that can become very toxic to the community if it gets out of hand, uh, you just go and you confront somebody directly rather than, and confront your feelings of rivalry. Thanks, Raven. Um, I'd love to riff a bit on you know, like, uh, maybe taking a step back further too, to say, like, I, I do agree that a lot of these dynamics of, of domination, you know, veiled or, or more, more upfront, um, masculine, feminine. I mean, I think it's important to say too, like, these are all, uh, apparent in a particular paradigm of, we'll just, you know, we've been speaking about a dominator paradigm. And so these are the kind of behaviors that I think actually get, you know, supported or, or enhanced in a dominator culture, because that's the way in which, you know, power can transact. You know, for example, I love what you said, um, I think it was Raven around uh, the physicality of, say, male confrontation, you know, in a dominator culture where women often are judged, say, on their bodies or on their viability, you know, to procreate and all these kind of things. The consequence of that, you know, violence could be very direct to their own status or their own power. So, of course, they have to be more veiled and come out sideways and, you know, coercive and all that. You know, I'm also thinking of... There was a book, uh, you know, very famous, you know, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, you know, came out a number of years ago. But I, I remember I was flipping through it one time and I was just like, what's so good about this book, you know? And uh, <clears throat> I read this one piece that said something like, you know, what is the one thing that men fear but in in relationships with women? And, you know, I'll just say, I'm pretty sure they're talking about hetero relationships. But what is the one thing that men fear? And, you know, I, you know, I sort of surmised and maybe you're wondering too, like, what is the one thing men fear? And this is what they found in their studies. Um, what they found was, that men ultimately fear uh, disapproval by women, which is so interesting, right? When you think about it, that disapproval then becomes a power uh, over men that, that women can wield within that system. And I just want to mention though, Pat McCabe is this indigenous grandmother I interviewed, you know, not that long ago. She had an incredible just exploration of her own journey through this process of like coming to terms with, you know, the patriarchal sort of trauma, traumatic wake through history. But she really brought up actually, and I just want to point this out, that the, the witch burnings in Europe had such a significant impact on the relationships of women between each other, right? That a lot of what we see now is in some ways like a deep mistrust of, of I think, women's culture in a sense and women of each other because of the wake of that consequence, right? When women were actually, you know, often what they needed to turn on each other or if they didn't, they were the ones that were dragged off and burned and all the rest. So it's like, it's understandable, right? That that still lives in the DNA of, of women's relational culture within the dominator paradigm. Yeah, it just struck me in as you were talking about um, Pat McCabe's work there. Um, you know, what is a witch, right? What does a witch do? Uh, which in, in some way is, is a, basically a shaman, arguably, who's using the, the kind of vegetable intelligence, uh, 
you know, of the earth, um, going into different realms and tapping into really powerful archetypal forces. You know, that's the thing that, that I think is, is one of the important aspects of it. Um, and what that brings up for me is, is the idea of the anxiety we have around that. You know, Jung talked about this a lot. I mean, it can actually overwhelm you completely going into the archetypal realm and tapping into these deep encoded ways of being. Um, and it's a, it's a threat to culture. It's certainly a threat to dominator culture, but it's probably a threat to civilization and culture to some degree anyway, because that unconscious archetypal energy um, is more powerful than our attempts to kind of contain it in civilization. Um, and where, where that brings me to is, is just a memory of the amount of times I've asked men or women or inquired like for myself, like what is the healthy version of uh, the masculine and feminine coming together? Like what does it actually look like? And what does it look like to be fully embodied in your masculinity or femininity and, you know, balance between those, those, we don't, you know, have the initiatory cultures um, very often that, that give us those models, right? So, so we, we are left kind of floundering. Um, and I wonder how much of what we experience is just this deep pain. Um, I'm, I'm reading this uh, book by Peter Kingsley, uh, Katafalk, which is a biography of Jung, which I highly recommend all the work by Peter Kingsley. But there's a part in it where he talks about howling. And howling is something the uh, prophets used to do. Um, prophets all around the world used to do. And, and particularly, you find it in the Bible, this deep kind of guttural howl, um, an animal sound, right? And it's that animal sound of a, uh, it's a kind of lament for nature, for our disconnection to nature, which, which goes back to what you were saying about modernism, Ian, this kind of complete disconnect. So, what I'd love to end on is, is to just get a sense of, yeah, what, the, what that brings up for everyone, but also like what, what is your conception of what a healthy meeting of these two polarities looks like? I really love that you brought up the howl. What it immediately brings up for me is the concept of the whale, or not even the concept, but the expression of the whale. Uh, like the wailing of a woman, the weeping, the uncontrollable expression of massive, uncontainable grief. The wail. And that to me is, is the gateway, right? I think in, in terms of thinking of the paradigm of, of dominator culture, which I really appreciate Ian bringing that up and, um, and how we, how we traverse through, how we, integrate these polarities is also inextricably linked with the expression of this deep-seated grief in the howl, in the wail. And through that physical expression, I think it, it you do have to make it physical. Like there's a sense of the embodiment of this thing for us to just talk about it and to, you know, speak about, even to speak about our experiences of it. Uh, but not to actually go out and to ex really fully and create the gesture within one's body is to miss out on the opportunity to feel this penetrating feeling that just ricochets through all aspects of your body. And when I have wailed, it's been something totally irreducible to words. And it moves things within me that I can't even particularly articulate. And yet I am refreshed and I become something other. It's like these singularity moments. There's these moments where you are just changed. And I think the expression of grief through the wail or the howl is maybe one of those moments of, of singularity where you come in one, as one kind of person and you leave another. And that those types of initiations, that type of expression of grief is inextricably linked to the capacity, opening up the capacity to even integrate the masculine and the feminine. Um, I would in no way claim that I've, you know, embodied these two principles in their fullest form in myself at this point in my life. No way. <laughs> like we all have so much to dig into in terms of our own bodies. Uh, and observing the relationships between people, being in participation with women, with men, 
with people in between who are experimenting in the gender spectrum. All of this, we have to be in participation with it in order to really integrate these polarities in our existence. Yeah, definitely. Touch, connection, feeling, willing, primal urges. There's a beckoning to return to the natural. In modernity, we are so used to the artificial, the superficial, the put on, the performative, the dressed up narrative. And this desire that people often claim is this return to tradition as the the meme says is really a deeper longing for an internal urge within oneself to express the fullest of one's nature, whether masculine or feminine or both. I mean, you can have both extremes coming from one person. It's not necessarily about what gender you were assigned at birth, but the energy that you're channeling and your ability to express it in this modern world in which gender has become a commodity that has been all but defiled, perhaps even defiled for agendas that have no relevance to our natural selves. And I mean, I really think that Raven and Mian are onto the, the healthy dynamic, which is the, the natural self, the returning to the root of the self, the root of the gender, the inner core, the beginning, the first seed, and what emanates from that seed, what evolves from our ancestors, what evolves from our contemporaries, and where are we going with all of this? What is gender right now? Will it change? Will the feminine and the masculine continue to have a rivalry with one another that simultaneously builds each force up? Will we see a a new revolution of the feminine or the masculine? Will we see a new feminism? Will we see a, a new male rights movement? Where are we going? And I think to answer that question, we need to look at the seeds of our biology, both culturally and anthropologically. And we are only just beginning to study these energies of our primal nature in the future. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I'd love to just highlight, you know, I think it's interesting that we began with this question of, you know, what's, what's up with gender, you know, in this moment. And, uh, and we ended in grief, actually, which I think is really interesting. You know, I'd love to just bring in an articulation from a teacher I've spent a number of years studying with, uh, Stephen Jenkinson. But he has a really beautiful articulation where he says, um, in the absence of grief, all you have is grievance. And I think that characterizes this moment, I think very, you know, succinctly that, you know, the inability to grieve means, you know, the kind of metastasized grief becomes grievance. And the nature of grievance is essentially you seek the obliteration of the other. Right. There's no, it doesn't matter. They can't apologize. They can't make it better because grievance, it knows no bounds. Right. It's just like you uh, gone. Right. And maybe that's like cancel culture. Maybe that explains a lot of this dynamics is like the grievance. Uh, there's no way to, to respond to that. Um, and we do see that, you know, people on the other side of it, you know, th- to feel that, you know, even reports, not just from men, but to say like, wow, I just felt like, you know, it didn't matter what I did or said or appeased or, or apologized or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And so I think the, to, to cultivate the ability to properly grieve as a necessary, you know, transmutation of that, those energies of the real, yeah, the, the trespass and the pain and the suffering and the rest, absolutely vital. Because I think if we can't be able to kind of, you know, get side by side and say, wow, how did it come to this? You know? If we can't, if we can't find each other in that and be like, wow, how did it come to this? Uh, from a like compassionate way, compassionate place, then, you know, it doesn't matter. Those, those energies will always be in opposition, you know, one up, one upping the other trying to. And so I feel like, you know, that to me is the needle to, to thread in a sense. Can we, can we find each other in the midst of the kind of mutual hurt from a domination culture, which, you know, again, has reasons for arising and we touched on some of them, you know, but are we going to be the generation to, 
you know, really begin to, to turn the tide on these things. And, and I do think it'll be a multi-generational effort, um, but I see signs. Beautiful. Thank you so much to, to all of you. And, and yeah, to echo what you were just saying, Ian, I think the trajectory that our conversation went on is, is um, yeah, powerful, powerful. And like kind of leaving me with a lot of food for thought as well. I mean, this is the oldest conversation in humanity, arguably, about this dynamic. And we've had a, um, a conversation that surely we could keep having for, for like six hours, I'm sure. But uh, it has to end somewhere. And um, I just want to say thanks. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Raven. And uh, yeah, take care. Since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, we've been thinking about how to create spaces for people to have new kinds of conversations around big ideas. Which is why we've just launched our digital campfire, which is a central place for people to gather, to find the others, and to make sense together. It's a place to practice the skills we talk about on the channel. So we have regular sessions that help us improve our sense making, and also tap into our collective intelligence. And it's all hosted on a discussion platform called Circle, where you can have conversations around our films and articles, or on any other topic you're interested in. We've designed it all to be participatory, so you can set up real-time conversations by creating a crew to dive deeper into different topics or practices. So we've got three different levels of membership, Wise Rebel, Explorer, and Sensemaker. All three levels have access to the digital campfire on Circle. And the explorers also have access to the following official Rebel Wisdom Run sessions. So on Mondays, we have live sense making, which is a session where we come together to discuss a hot cultural topic. And then on Tuesdays, we have our academy sessions, where we have some of the best facilitators in the world teaching various skills. So for example, collective intelligence practice, facilitation training. Then on Thursday, we have our connection gym. And the sense makers are also invited to our Wednesday sessions, which alternates between Q&A and the Wisdom Gym. The Q&A is with one of the stars of our films and will often go up on the channel itself. And the Wisdom Gym is where we bring in some of the biggest names in transformation and growth to share their practices with us. Within Circle, we've also included a number of resources that we found useful. So sense making tools, meditations, authentic relating games, and guides for how to host your own session. So the most important thing to remember is that this is an experimental space and is designed to be participatory. So it's really your space to come in and make your own. So we'd love to see you there.